Hello, I'm Alexandra Monroe, Senior Curator and Director of Curatorial Affairs for Guggenheim Abu Dhabi and Senior Curator of Asian Art and uh, Senior Advisor Global Arts of the Guggenheim Museum. And I am dialing in, zooming in from New York with Mariko Mori, who is joining us from Tokyo. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the series Waiting for the Future, presented by Guggenheim Abu Dhabi as part of our digital pivot during this extraordinary time that we're living in that is keeping us from going mostly in person to the museums we love and support. Today's talk is Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, a conversation with Mariko Mori. Uh, I am, uh, want to welcome you, Mariko, from Tokyo. How long have you been in lockdown there? Uh, I, I came back here uh, end of March, uh, but it's quite active here in Tokyo. Uh, so it's really no longer lockdown, seems. Uh, but uh, how is everything in New York? I'm so pleased that the Guggenheim Museum is reopened and uh, people are, are, are thrilled to be back in museums. Uh, so it's good. My, my brain was starved for art, so we feel refreshed again. But we are very excited to have you with us today, Mariko. And before we start our conversation, I thought I would just give our uh, friends and listeners a little bit of background. Uh, for those of you who uh, may not know your work as well. Um, as we know, Mariko was born in 1967 and has lived and worked in Tokyo, London, and New York since the early 1990s. Her work, I have written, is a world unto itself, intersecting art, technology, science, astronomy, astrophysics, archaeology, the feminine force and spirituality. Few artists working anywhere apply such rigorous research to their work or cross as many boundaries between individual humanist expression and monumental projects designed for eternity. In her early photographs, when I first got to know Mariko's work in Tokyo in the early 1990s, she staged performances of herself as a cyborg, which was then a very cosmic and novel uh, being to contemplate in the flesh. We'd read about them in science fiction, but few artists had begun to uh, play around with projections of these futuristic beings. By the mid 1990s, she took advantage of new technological advancements and inserted herself, this time in the guise of a futuristic mermaid or lying inert in a plexiglass time capsule into the panoramic frames of her improbable vistas. Along the way, her work got larger and larger, not only in scale, but in concept and technological and technical ambition. Morty's hybridized, hybridized self began to assume, I'd say, more spiritual incarnations in the late 1990s. And I want to ask you about how this evolution came about with the film that we're going to see shortly, Miko no Imori, The Shaman Girl's Prayer, which you debuted in 1996, and also the extraordinary video um, Nirvana which of course is alluding to the Buddhist spiritual realm uh, that is uh, uh, beyond the stage of uh, uh, incarnation. In the series of photo murals, Esoteric Cosmos, we will be discussing today, which are in the collection of Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, the artist appears as a goddess, part ancient, part anime, part pop, hovering amid rocky terrains, seascapes, and stalagmite-covered caves. What is it that Mariko is investigating? And what is it that drives this extraordinary sense of purity, beauty, and cosmic vision 
Those are some of the questions that we want to explore with the artist today. I do want to call attention to about a decade ago, Mariko founded the FAO Foundation. Uh, this is a non-for-profit organization that basically helps her to realize an extraordinary series of monumental installations that are relating to nature that she intends will stand, as I mentioned, as monuments for eternity. And we will be discussing some of those as well. And the complexity of working with governments, with organizations such as UNESCO or the uh, uh, World Olympics uh, to uh, install these improbable, extraordinary events that combine and connect man, the gods, and the universe. There have been numerous solo exhibitions of Mariko's work at the Dallas Museum of Art, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Centre National de Art Contemporain in Grenoble, the Kunsthaus Bergens, Groninger Museum in Holland, the Baltic Center for Contemporary Art in Gateshead. And her work has been seen in numerous biennials, including Venice, Istanbul, Sydney, Sao Paulo, Shanghai, uh, as well as Singapore. And we were very thrilled to have her work in the museum, uh, Guggenheim Museum collection link uh, shown at the Moving Pictures exhibition at Guggenheim Museum Bilbao. Uh, and, uh, uh, we are now going to start um, by just immersing you in the 1996 uh, film Miko no Imori. And we will return after the showing of this film. That's not Miko no Imori. Sorry, we need to change. That's Dream Temple. Now off, if we could change to Miko no Imori. Thank you. Sorry, friends. We're holding that surprise for a little bit later. Miko no Imori means uh, sort of girl shaman priestess. Nico is the name, uh, the term for. Go. 
Uh, Marika, so that is a beautiful, beautiful work that you made in 1996. You're channeling, channeling a Shinto child priestess or shaman, conducting a rite to summon the gods. But here you have transformed the Miko into a cyborg and staged her sacred dance in the Kansai International Airport designed by Renzo Piano, which when it opened, and I remember I was in Japan then, it was hailed as the most futuristic site in the world. What is this work about? And what, how did, what inspired you to make this work and how is it transitional in your earlier practice and what came up, comes after? Um, so the words that I'm singing, it's uh, the words, it's melting and the world becoming one. Uh, so um, in a way, this work was uh, probably uh, the very uh, uh, early work that which I started to kind of uh, introducing some, um, uh, the Buddhist idea of the world to be one. Uh, and uh, also the, the circulation, the dance, it's about the circulation. So the, the crystal uh, ball, it's almost like a soul. So it's coming out of the uh, uh, womb and then come out to the world, but it's come back to the womb. So it's kind of a, a, a continuous circulation. So, so this was kind of the, really the, the first work I can depict the concept of Buddhism. I would, uh, next please, we're now gonna start the PowerPoint. I, I think that the concept of Buddhism is very, very strong and we will be discussing that. Uh, in this work, I think you're also very much referencing Shinto. And here is an image of a traditional Miko circa 1900, which are these young girls dressed in this extraordinary costume that in itself depicts uh, the cosmos. Uh, uh, and uh, I think your, your costume is every bit as good. <laughs> but you also have these like images of regalia and your sense, the, the, the sphere. Um, can you just talk a little bit about, about the influence of Shinto also in the conception of your, of Miko no Inori, the yes. prayer of the shaman girl? Yes. So the, the Shintoism, it's uh, the originated uh, quite early. I think even go back to uh, uh, Yayoi period. I wouldn't say German period, but it's particularly uh, Yayoi period. So it's we have a, such a long history over uh, uh, two thousand over two thousand years. Uh, so the the uh, the fundamental idea is to honor nature, and so there's a. Uh, um, the nature gods. Uh, uh, Sometimes we um, we the transcend it into some site, or some site is always uh, existed. Uh, but it's really to worship the nature gods. Uh, mm -hmm. And the miko, it's uh, like a, a meaning of a priestess, which are to serve a nature gods, like do offering. Sometimes offering a dance, or sometimes offering the, you know, the ribbon, uh, uh, the cloth. Uh, uh, but it's really a um, way to kind of connect the words of nature gods to the uh, to the society in a way. Uh, so for the Miko no Inori, Inori means prayer. So in a way, it's like the uh, con at the time, the contemporary way to pray at mm -hmm. uh, uh, artificial uh, man-made uh, airport. Yeah, amazing. So I think this synthesis that you're describing of temporality and space between ancient and contemporary worlds, between magic and technology, and of course, nature, um, 
has become central to your practice. I'd like to move next to the uh, grand work Esoteric Cosmos, uh, which is in the collection of Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. These are four large scale uh, prints, digital prints, uh, in which you have summoned really the structure of the universe. Um, images of you are in each one of these uh, images um, a, you rendered in real landscapes and populated with animation like creatures drawn from Japanese popular culture as well as direct references to esoteric Buddhist art which we'll see some examples of um, in a moment. Each one is like a fantasy of the cosmos so a symbol of the relationship between human gods, the universe and, and nature. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the concept for this work? And uh, maybe we can go to the, the first one next, please. Uh, can we talk about one slide back? Yes. One slide back. So, okay. Yes, so this is the... Uh, um, uh, I was inspired by a mandala and uh, the very left top represent wind and then the right top represent fire and then next would be a uh, uh, left bottom it representing water and then the right bottom representing earth. So in mandala it's the wind causes fire, fire causes water, water causes earth, and then from earth it's become empty. And then from empty, it causes wind. So it's a continuous circulation. And uh, also the wind represent conceiving. So the glass uh, um, a capsule, it's like a womb. And then uh, uh, the fire, it's representing practitioner, and then the water representing enlightenment, and then the earth representing nirvana. So this is kind of a, a, the circulation. Beautiful. So I'd like to speak about um, some of these images individually and share with our viewers some of the references that you have mentioned um, inspired your thinking and research. Um, these, uh, so next please. Uh, so here is uh, Mariko as the central image that is part of uh, Bodhisattva and part, uh, uh, you know, these forms of, of both female but also somewhat androgynous female deities with what would traditionally be apsaras or celestial beings playing music to accompany the descent of the deity from the heavenly cosmos, the heavenly being um, uh, space to, to earth. Um, next, please. And these are some of the images drawn from a traditional Japanese culture that are very, very revered in the history of Japanese art and Japanese Buddhism. Uh, and uh, uh, Mariko, I'd love to, for you to speak to what is the process of this kind of appropriation and innovation, um, not only formally and stylistically, but, but I think your, uh, at the core of this work is a, a challenge to modernity and a challenge to Western orthodoxy and ideology and a challenge to science. Uh, with the interruption of this alternative knowledge system, in this case, esoteric Buddhism, which has its roots in India and in the Himalayan kingdoms where tantric Buddhism was developed in the sixth, seventh and eighth centuries and thence came to Japan. Uh, what, what, uh, what is radical? What to you is most radical about this conscious usurpation, appropriation of uh, esoteric Buddhism to bring a message to contemporary 
society today? Yes. Um, so the um, I was I was quite moved by uh, actually all the sites that I visited uh, because uh, the at the time uh, the Photoshop was not available because it's 1996. Uh, it's not stock image. Each image uh, uh, we actually went to photograph at the uh, site. Uh, so why I had the concept in my mind to represent this wind, fire, water, earth, uh, I visited all the site. Uh, and while I'm visiting, I really experienced of discovering the power of nature. Uh, at the same time, I kind of uh, I tried to contemplate to trying to kind of uh, um, like uh, uh, trying to get the, the state of mind, uh, the work for Nabana, which is a 3D video, uh, the same as the Purand, the, the, the same costume and the, everything, but it's a 3D video. Uh, I actually wanted to physically experience uh, the mind of uh, uh, Bodhisattva I tried. And uh, so in the process, I really, I thought that I wanted to kind of uh, embed, embed my experience into the work. Uh, and um, mm, so therefore, uh, you know, pe perhaps audience won't see it, but I have also experienced uh, 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 kind of spiritual experience behind the scene through the process of the work that I really wanted to uh, uh, share. And uh, this particular one, the, the character surrounding uh, which were, I call it tune, and this you can see like Alexandra Blot, but this court musician, of the, you know, the praying instrument. Uh, however, I wanted to kind of uh, 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 produce something that kind of uh, uh, connected the future because I wanted to make this uh, uh, idea alive, not just left behind in a history. Absolutely. And by alive, we mean vital and significant and get giving new meaning and interpretation to this repository that is both a splendid visual repository that I think has informed the refinement of your own aesthetic, but it is also a uh, repository of, of, of cosmic insight, which has continually evolved in your own practice. So I'd like to just move quickly through the remaining slides of Esoteric Cosmos. We're very excited that the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi uh, owns this work and it will be on view uh, in the future museum. Uh, where it uh, occupies a, a, a place of great importance uh, with other artists' work who are similarly sort of transgressing these boundaries of uh, uh, wisdom repositories and very contemporary technology. Uh, again, with this work that uh, Mariko refers to as fire um, in the cycle of the mandala, uh, one possible reference for this is uh, next. Again, a uh, very uh, famous uh, cycle of Buddhist mule figures or uh, sort of demon-like figures, um, kings of wisdom. Um, next, Mariko, where did you shoot this? The, the, this again is obviously a composite photograph and please note the scale of this, it's nearly three meters long, but uh, where did you find this cave or this, uh, uh, this great uh, desert? Uh, this was in uh, south of France. Uh, and then the, the next one, it's, um, 
Next image, please. Next, this one, it's a painted desert plus windmill uh, on uh, California plus a biosphere, the dome of the biosphere. So three places in one. And I just have to point out that technically in 1996, all of these photographic digital technologies were absolutely the cutting edge. Uh, where did you make these? Who, who, who produced this for you? Because the uh, technicians you work with are also part of your entire project of collaboration. I want us to remember and think about these works as massive rites of mobilization, um, not only technical, but, but the travel and the uh, uh, permissions to photograph in these rare sites. Uh, it is a massive project of organization and, and realizing a, a very, very large scale vision. It's virtually uh, a form of public art. He, well, uh, so the at the time, again, the Photoshop was not available. So the only advertisement agency has this uh, kind of uh, access to a large supercomputer to make these uh, images and uh, it's called paint box. Uh, so the, all the photographs are taken by eight by 10 camera. So it's, it's a large format, not the iPhone. <laughs> uh, and uh, all scan and then kind of a, a photo montage with this a huge uh, computer at a time because it was 1996. Um, if you could go back to uh, the first pure image, uh, I would like to also mention that it's the photograph at the Dead Sea. Yes, on the right. Uh, the, the next one, please. Next. Yes, so this one was a Dead Sea. And uh, on the, the, the glass, kind of a, a, a tower on the right top. It's actually a glass sculpture that are produced in New York. <laughs> and, uh, but this landscape was uh, the photographed at the Dead Sea. And uh, mm. uh, I enjoy being there too. Mm. Extraordinary. So um, uh, let's uh, look at these in scale so that our viewers can understand the, the sort of immersive environmental qualities of these, which I think also relate to your film. Your film work uh, informed the production of these photographs and the photographs in turn informed the production of your film as these immersive sites of of magic and transformation, uh, uh, as well as just the sheer spectacle of their um, visual splendor. Uh, they're really, really extraordinary. Um, we want to speak next about uh, one of the major works that gained international attention, uh, Dream Temple uh, in 1999. Uh, uh, when you created this work, it was the most ambitious immersive and interactive installation you had ever made. Since then, you have only become more ambitious and the sites have become even larger scale. Um, it is still an iconic work of the millennial era. Uh, and uh, you have spoken how this, the, the form of this work uh, refers again to Horyuji's Yumedono Hall of Dreams, a structure on the grounds of Japan's earliest imperially commissioned Japanese Buddhist temple. Uh, and uh, you say it inspired not only the form, but, but maybe also the purpose. Uh, if we could go back to the uh, image and then we'll show the digital uh, walkthrough. Uh, but as I recall, one entered this structure uh, and again, you were one of the first to use biofeedback uh, art where we had electrodes on our head and we were uh, 
uh, immersed in a projection of a uh, of a of a filmic work. Could you describe what what that experience is and how you produced it? Uh, the one with the electrode, it's, it was a way before that the one, the large one was at the IBM building that you entered, I remember very much. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, you're yes. absolutely right. Excuse me. Yes. yes. So this one also is, part of my name. Yeah. Yes. So this one, it's, uh, uh, well, the similar technology in terms of projection. So it's, it's a dome projection and uh, one person each time enter and a four minutes, 44 second uh, a video experience with a 3D sound. And uh, mm, so it's, it's you, you enter into this, uh, uh, you see the dome in a glass temple, uh, but you actually physically enter into the dome to experience the video, which we could uh, share through digital dream temple. So in 2020, uh, uh, Mariko produced a digital walkthrough. So let's let's show that, um, and uh, we'll we'll ask Mariko a few more questions about Dream Temple while that is being um, uh, while that is being screened. Uh, Should I? Close the it's video. Going to be coming on shortly, and I'm also pleased to say that Mariko has generously allowed this walkthrough that we're seeing now of Dream Temple uh, to be live through Saturday on www.dreamtemple.net. But Mariko, why don't you walk us through what's happening and what this yes. digital rendering is is actually yes. doing? Yes, so um, I was interested in, in uh, uh, the Mind Only School uh, uh, series of uh, 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 Alaya Consciousness, which were um, introduced by Asanga and Basbandu. Uh, and um, mm, this was the, the idea, the structure of the mind with deeper consciousness. The deeper consciousness is a seventh and eighth consciousness. So the, when you go, in, go into this uh, uh, the, uh, animation, which you are actually surrounded by the 3D uh, uh, dome projection. So the rain actually coming from the top of your head, not flat because what you see is flat, but when you see it, you are surrounded by the image. Uh, so the process is to going down deeper into your uh, deeper consciousness of Alaya. Uh, the Alaya consciousness is a key for the reincarnation. So uh, it's almost like a, a, the string of a chanting beat. The each beat is like a, from past, past life, to present life, to the future life. But the thread itself, it's like a liar consciousness, which connecting past life to the present to the future life. So the mind only school is to uh, introduce the idea of um, finding a liar consciousness and departing out of a liar consciousness. So you no longer has to be born again to, in order to go to Nirvana. So this was a, a, a idea that I was very much interested in at the time. And so this is a process of going to find your alaya uh, consciousness. Mm -hmm. So uh, once uh, after this thing, it's actually a little bit slow uh, at the moment, but you will enter into kind of a uh, your central uh, universe, which which are um, the almost like your son of the uh, our solar system. Uh, so the all the planets around us, uh, all the planets of the solar system, it's actually uh, coming out from you because in this projection, it, it's all the position that 
this planet is coming out of your stomach area. Uh, then this is the light, which is, I call it now, uh, uh, internal sun. But this is, I believe it's uh, what Alaya consciousness will like. This obviously is my imagination, but the idea of uh, Alaya consciousness is that you no longer, you no longer has yourself and in a way you are surrounded by all these uh, uh, different souls. And uh, this thing is more like you connecting to a different soul because you no longer has division between self and others. So you are connected and no longer your uh, self. And the idea was that initiating to becoming cosmic conscious, which is you by the self and uh, you kind of, you are all uh, this eternal uh, universe. This is a kind of uh, idea behind this image. It, it also relate very much to your drawings. Are these, uh, uh, images that we're seeing animated based on your drawings? That's correct. I made all these drawings and then uh, first I make a drawings and then, and then after, sometime I make a paintings, but then I uh, share with uh, uh, the computer graph. But this time I, I have to mention, it was uh, produced by a Shiseido computer graphic team. Uh, so I stayed at Shiseido for uh, over three months and uh, uh, they worked day and night, almost 24 hours uh, to make this computer graphic animation. And also I had to mention it was a Sony technology that uh, provided the 3D sound uh, system. So it's when the uh, animation moves around it's also corresponding with the 3D sound that it was very new at the time, 1998, when I produced. And who were the composers that you work with for this uh, synthetic, synthetic electronic music? Thank you very much for mentioning. It's Kenny Keda. Uh, I collaborated with him for uh, many uh, artwork. He also uh, uh, was a composer for Miko Noinori sound as well. Yes, wonderful, thank you. Uh, so I, we're coming to the end of the hour, but I thought we would just uh, quickly return to the PowerPoint to talk very briefly, uh, Mariko, before we turn to questions um, for the uh, work you're doing with the Fao Foundation. Next, please. Um, we're going to talk about Sun Pillar and ring. Uh, so over the last decade, um, Mariko, you've become very interested in archeology. span um, In addition to Shinto and Buddhism and the mandalas and consciousness and everything that you're speaking about um, and the you know, sort of uh, uh, very elaborate forms of, of meditation and, and mind awareness that you're speaking about and how that is transferred into the imagery of your art and into the experience of your art, you have taken it to yet another dimension. Um, you've erected extraordinary, well, I mean, they're really monuments, they're more than sculptures, in remote natural sites, such as here, the Miyako Island in the southernmost Japanese archipelago, and what we'll see in a moment, please, the um, waterfall in the Brazilian forest. 
Uh, these works are all about light and the essential elements of land, water, forest, and sky. Um, do you want to just briefly talk to us about these projects and uh, your ambition for taking this to all seven continents across the planet Earth? Yes, so um, I started this project, uh, the first project was done in uh, 2011. Uh, the, the FAO Foundation founded in 2010, our mission is to uh, install site-specific uh, uh, installation per continent to honor nature. So the first one is to honor the uh, ocean, the sea, and, uh, and this one, it's uh, particularly during the winter solstice when the uh, sun goes down, the, you can see the sun right on to top of the sun pillar, and then uh, it will cast shadow to the future work called Moonstone, which will be brought on a bay in the future. And then uh, for the, for the uh, ring also, next, uh, the, if you could show the next slide, please. Yes, so the ring also this time is to honor waterfall. Uh, this is really beautiful. Uh, it looks short, but it's actually 58 meter tall. And uh, this was done uh, uh, with uh, a cultural program of Rio Olympic in 2016, but both installation are permanent. And next slide, please. So also during the winter solstice, sun actually passed through the ring. So the sun and ring emerged and become just light. And then when the sun moves out and then you see the ring again. So it's really to honor nature uh, in a way that I was uh, obviously inspired by the idea of uh, Shintoism to honor nature, but in Japan, the reason for uh, uh, we were able to protect nature because of the worshiping of the nature that we are uh, maintain and sustaining the uh, pristine nature. So I thought that uh, uh, art installation can be contributed to be in order to protect nature and to uh, also to honor nature and also to promote the idea that we can coexist with nature, like how our remote ancestor were able to do, uh, really to bring a consciousness of oneness with nature. Uh, can we go back to the archeological slide uh, to illustrate Mariko's point? Yes. Um, uh, Mariko, we have wonderful questions that have come in. I'd like to spend the next few minutes uh, sharing with you questions from our viewers and listeners. Uh, one is, can you tell us about your interest in pop culture and how it is reflected specifically in the Esoteric Cosmos series? Okay, uh, maybe we can go back to the slide, to Pure Land perhaps? Oh yes, okay, so, um, the, when I was a child, uh, the Tezuka Osamu's Astro Boy was very popular, like when I was three or two or three years old. And uh, the Tezuka Osamu uh, really showed the image of the future. And uh, uh, it was really um, all the all the, the uh, kids around that time was very much uh, uh, obsessed with Astro Boy, how uh, he could be uh, um, reading to the, to the future. So our mind are, co are quite uh, kind of uh, uh, um, influenced by those images and uh, so the popular culture was just almost everyday life. And uh, we don't question, we just lived in popular culture. And uh, why not? <laughs> uh, I, you know, people think that, you know, I, 
actually uh, taking popular culture into to the artwork, but but we live we were living in popular culture quite deep, and uh, so this is quite uh, natural and uh, uh, normal to kind of you know bring the popular culture into work. Mm -hmm. um... Uh, having grown up in Japan, I, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I think what's sort of remarkable about Japan is the coexisting contradiction of that kind of science fiction world and something as radical as Astro Boy, which is, of course, a classic in uh, uh, the history of animation. Uh, and, and again, the very, the very vital presence of ancient culture and wisdoms and, and ritual that has gone on uninterrupted since really the sixth or seventh centuries. Whereas in so many surrounding countries, including Korea and China, there have been so many radical and violent interruptions to that history that um, it does not have the same sense of continuity and practice that, that we find in Japan, which has obviously touched you. So that brings us to another question is, um, is your persona in this esoteric series, is it um, a goddess? Um, do you see yourself as a performer or narrator in these works of art or both? Performer or narrator? What is a na na narrator? Uh, are, you a, are you a performer or are you um, actually trying to tell a story? Ah, yes. You, is, uh, in a sort of didactic way. Yes. Um, well, in a way, it's both. But really, I, that uh, uh, because my uh, uh, past experience of uh, uh, being in a model uh, and uh, having uh, experience in, in a fashion uh, industry, uh, I was able to... Um, utilize my own body and to produce uh, images like this. Uh, so obviously it's, it's kind of in a way performance, but really that uh, I wanted, to, I have some uh, very specific uh, uh, vision to uh, bring, which, you were, which was a mandala, that the concept of mandala I wanted to bring. So uh, in a way, is it's it's a boss. Mm -hmm. So also on this series, um, the question is, uh, do you have a personal connection to the places that you photographed or where you place your sculptures? What is the connection uh, you have to these sites? I don't have a personal connection to the site, although uh, the, the next one, please, uh, next one, please. The next slide, please. Uh, sorry, the sorry. Then the burning desire, please. Yeah, you could do this one too. So uh, uh, this one, it's in the uh, um, uh, Gobi Desert. Uh, the flaming cliff. The place is called Flaming Cliff, and uh, this one, you know, uh, the monk, uh, the Chinese monk, wrote the sutra from the uh, India and uh, Son Goku, Son Goku no hanashi wakaru kana? And you know, the, uh, the monkeys and uh, you know, some animals, they were uh, the, the, well, anyway, so the- Classic, this, classic the, Buddhist story between India and China. This is about the transmission of Buddhism from India to China in the seventh century. Yes, yes, thank you, Alexander. So this is actually the path. It's not exactly here, but it's, this is a path. The, the Flaming Creek was a path of this uh, monk from a uh, uh, Blinking uh, Sutra to, from India to China. The and, ancient uh, road. Yes, so uh, I kind of uh, tried to uh, uh, choose a site relationship has a relationship to the uh, story behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. I think there are one or two questions and then we'll I think I close on this. 
Um, again, it was partially, you know, my interest as a student um, and also practitioner of Japanese Buddhism. Uh, I uh, perhaps uh, uh, encourage Mariko today to, to speak specifically about this uh, uh, philosophical references, metaphysical references, and visual references to Japanese Buddhist and Shinto art and practices. And the question is, uh, what do practitioners today, like, you know, in, in the Shinto community or in the Buddhist community, what do they think of your work? Mm. Well, uh, uh, when I visit the Shinto shrine, including Ise, including Izumo, including uh, Omiwa, all the uh, if, like uh, in a recent visit, I always bring this my project with Fao, with some pillar and ring, and I show it to them, and uh, I, I think they understand what I'm trying. They don't particularly. Uh, familiar with the contemporary art, but I think they uh, 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 sympathize with my project. And uh, so um, I feel I, I, I was a, I'm able to connect. Um, and I still uh, keep the relationship with uh, some of the, uh, uh, the head monk when I was studying mind only school, uh, it's, I mean, although these are two different uh, belief system, but I think in Japan, it's, it's kind of quite emerged. It can't really take apart. Uh, it doesn't contradict, uh, it seems does, but it's kind of a, uh, Honoring nature, it's the same as honoring uh, uh, Buddha's mind. And so there is a, a kind of a, a connection. We were able to have two uh, system kind of coexist. And um, mm, I don't know if I answer your question. No, no, no. no I think that's very, I, th I, think, I think if I may say so, because I've been with Mariko in the company of some of these individuals, um, the cool ones definitely understand. <laughs> um, uh, and the cool ones are practicing uh, uh, either meditation practices uh, or uh, Shinto performances and rites as a very contemporary and again, vital and relevant way to communicate with the, with nature and the cosmos and is a way to evolve the human mind and the human brain, which is never stops, no matter what age or temporality or period you live in. There's, there's no interest in um, uh, sort of embalming these religious practices or really spiritual or metaphysical practices um, in Japan or, or really anywhere else in East Asia. It, there's a fundamental understanding that these wisdoms have immediate and ongoing and contemporary relevance to our lives in the 21st century. And I think what your power of your work, Mariko, is that you give us an imagery to bridge into that awareness and that, that, that transcendence while presenting us with just sheer spectacular beauty. We can choose to follow your path or not. That's not, these are not didactic works. They're not compulsory works. They are splendid works of the imagination. And that is where art and um, transcendent practices really, really, uh, are, are, are unified is, is in the encounter to kind of change our state of being and become um, a little bit more uh, aware of our surroundings. 
so uh, thank you so much, Mariko. I, I want to thank you for a beautiful, beautiful conversation. Um, and thank you for joining us from Tokyo. Uh, to our viewers uh, and listeners, I want to announce that the second one in this series of Waiting for the Future will be a conversation next week with my colleague Sasha Kalter Wasserman and YZ Kami, another wonderful artist in whose work is in the collection of Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, we've gone a few minutes over, uh, but I want to thank everyone for your wonderful questions. And I want to thank Mariko and the whole team of Guggenheim Abu Dhabi in Abu Dhabi and New York for helping us produce today's uh, uh, Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, a conversation with Mariko Mori.